big book that was changing things, this, this changed so many things, we still need to have a good idea of the background, where, where we were. So in terms of mathematics, um, he, Rene Descartes was there first, and this is the guy that did Cartesian coordinates, if you've heard of Cartesian coordinates. Basically, uh, allowed geometry to become a serious science that people could work with. Okay, um, he did a lot in terms of uh, making algebra and geometry work. He was primarily a philosopher and mathematician, um, but one of the interesting things that he did, he got for us, was that uh, he believed that the entire universe operated on mechanical principles. That's a big step forward in terms of science, to think that way, as opposed to trying to explain things sort of as they come along. This explains this. Uh, we explain one things in terms of others. Um, a, a very different way of thinking about it. So um, also predating Newton was Galileo. And he did an awful lot of uh, useful things too. He actually started to understand falling objects. Um, but he did it sort of as a ratio of times um, or distances. He had inclined planes that he would roll balls down. And he could understand that it didn't really matter what the angle was, the distance increased, the ratio of the distances increased by odd numbers. And that was the beginning of understanding what's going on when something falls. And of course, he was able to extrapolate to falling objects, which uh, it's not entirely clear that uh, that was an experiment that was done. But there were a lot of things about Galileo's life that are not entirely clear they were perfect. Uh, the, the stories are completely true. But nonetheless, he did get some of it. But notice, this is still a very discrete way of looking at the world, one step at a time. Very discrete mathematics. Uh, not looking at the whole universe, looking at pieces, one bit at a time. Uh, but he is, he is credited with an interesting uh, little statement here. You can do this. out what the area in the function is. Okay? 
area of the function. One way to do it would be divide the area up into rectangles. And so he's, he's figuring out some rectangles to work from. And if you get the rectangles, maybe you can figure out the area. Now, this is not news. Uh, this was 2,000 years earlier, people were thinking in terms of that, trying to figure out areas with rectangles like that. Uh, but Newton did understand some things about it. Um, you know, you, you want to determine, are you inside the curve? Are you outside the curve? What size rectangles are we talking about? So we work from that. But here's the step that Newton did that nobody else could quite understand. And that was make the rectangles smaller. Smaller and smaller and smaller. Once you get the rectangles to be infinitesimal, yeah, the concept of exceedingly small rectangles was what got Newton to calculus, brought calculus together. This had the amazing change in the universe of going from discrete to continuous. You could now talk about smooth curves and understand what was going on with them. You could do the area under a curve, under any curve, under any shape, much better. And the, the continuous world, going from everything had to be sort of described by a step at a time, to we can have smooth motion, we can understand that sort of thing, was a huge change, huge. And it, it led to many uh, mathematical improvements over the next century or so. Uh, huge changes in mathematics. But there were other things, okay. Um, he did some excellent things in terms of gravitation. Well, gravitation is an understanding of a little bit useful, and very useful, in astronomy, trying to understand what's going on in the cosmos. That's where you really see gravitation come, come out. Um, but to set the stage, the Co Copernican Revolution had already determined that the universe was reasonably he heliocentric. Uh, Galileo had bought into that and worked from there. Um, and Johannes Kepler, again, just before Newton, had taken some precise astronomical data and shown that Mars is actually orbiting in an ellipse. And that allowed Kepler to write Kepler's laws, which state, among other things, that in equal times, uh, orbits will sweep out equal areas. And it doesn't matter whether it's circular or elliptical, but the area will, be, will stay the same as it goes per, per, per unit of time. Okay, so at that point he's starting, Kepler's starting to get some of how can we describe the universe? How can we explain what's going on in the universe? But he doesn't quite have it. Newton comes along, a figure from the Principia, Principia um, with and a better understanding of gravitation. And he determines that gravitation is a uh, one over r squared field, basically. Um, that's huge. That allows Newton to um, predict an amazing number of things. Uh, he now has orbits of planets going very well makes sense. The heliocentric universe actually starts to make a lot of sense when you can describe it as motions like this. In about, uh, there, there were several, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> this whole idea was an excellent explanation that would start to describe orbits in general he could predict what was going to happen as something orbited. And of course, the, the 
story of the apple. Um, probably didn't go exactly like that. But nonetheless, in about, I think it was 1845 or so, one of the more dramatic uses of Newton's system or, or confirmations of Newton's ideas of gravitation, gravitation was um, Neptune. Um, because it required an understanding of the mathematics to be able to figure out where it was, and lo and behold, there it was. Okay? If you understood how the gravitation was working in the solar system, there was a little bit of a discrepancy. They looked for what would fix that discrepancy, and another planet would do it, and lo and behold, there was a planet. Uh, awesome. But Newton paved the way with this type of discovery to what is modern rocketry. Uh, this is Apollo 11. And I just have to show it. So, so, okay. 20 seconds and counting. Three, two, one, go. This was the takeoff for, for Apollo 11. Seconds. Guidance is internal. 12. Anybody know who was in there? 10. Nine. Well, that's sad. First people to go to the moon and, and walk on the moon. But basically, Newton's laws, F equals MA, and gravitation are exquisitely shown in this very activity of humankind. The action that it took to get to the moon. There's a quote from uh, the movie Apollo 13 that you might remember that uh, we have now put Sir Isaac Newton in the driver's seat. Uh, at some point in that movie, they say something to that effect. And the basic concept there is that if you understand the laws of physics, the laws of motion here, that once you have the rocket ship started, it will follow the trajectory that the gravitational objects in the path will, will give it. You don't need to do any more. And to a huge extent, that's what they did with Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Very few burns of rockets to get you. And now uh, Voyager 2, I believe it is. Um, and then I don't remember which one it is. Uh, one of the Voyagers now is just about one light day away from us. 
it has recently crossed what they call the heliopause, which is it is now beyond the extent of our solar system. Our sun has no more impact on the space around it, um, which is, that's as far away as anything man-made has ever gotten, okay? Um, but they did it, and in the process, they managed to pass by, do flybys of uh, Jupiter, uh, a couple, couple flybys with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and got some, some of the more spectacular pictures that we have of those bodies. Uh, launched in 1972 or so, uh, 77, I guess. Um, an amazing result. Okay. Einstein, <laughs> Einstein. Um, Newton also wrote a treatise on optics, wrote a considerable amount about optics, and of course that's my area of specialty, so that's where I'm more excited about what he's done. Um, but again, to give the background, Galileo created uh, the Galilean telescope. It's not, not fair to say that Galileo invented the telescope because he didn't. It was patented before he started working on the telescope. But uh, he did manage to improve it considerably. Uh, he, he could improve it in a lot of ways. And through those telescopes, he looked at our solar system and learned huge amounts about the, the way things are in our solar system. That's different than the way things work. But he did learn about the way things are quite a bit. Um, Johannes Kepler continued some of this work. As I said, he got the uh, orbital motion uh, that, it, that paths our ellipses down pat. He, got, he figured that one out. He did a lot in optics, though, too. Um, did a pinhole camera, could actually design eyeglasses, um, could explain why you need two eyes for depth perception, um, understood magnification, and the principles of the telescope. So there was a lot of good things happening in terms of optics just before Newton came along. But Newton did some of his own things. Oh, sorry, Descartes too. Uh, Descartes worked on rainbows. He, he just loved rainbows and worked on those. He could explain why it was bow shaped. He could explain a lot about rainbows. He could do the geometry of rainbows because, of course, Descartes was good at geometry. He did the geometry of rainbows to death. Definitely understood that. Unfortunately, his theories could not explain the colors in the rainbow, which was maybe the most spect spectacular part. So Descartes was good, but he didn't quite have it. He also had reflection that was quite helpful. Um, Snell's law was already involved at this point was already developed so these people did understand a little bit about tra uh, transmitting into other materials but Newton could add color to the rainbow he did it by studying the prism in fact um, the prism gave us um, refrangibility of light. That is, the way the prism does it is it breaks light into its colors. So that's refraction in modern terms, but uh, his term was refrangibility. He wrote a, a paper, a new theory about light and colors, uh, and he actually published it in about 1670 or so, 71 and 72. But um, I just think to get a sense of of the way Newton would think about things, I need to read some of that paper. Um, so this was in beginning in the year 1666. And, and so he says, and in order thereto, having darkened my chamber and made a small hole in the window uh, shuts, 
to let a convenient quantity of, of sunlight in, I placed my prism at his entrance that it might thereby refract, thereby refracted to the opposite wall. It was at first a very pleasing divertisement to view the vivid and intense colors produced thereby. Okay, this is a scientific paper. He's just kind of chatting with you, telling you how he's going to do the science. He made a, a hole in his wall and put a prism in front of it and saw the rainbow. And it was uh, a very pleasing divertisement. Uh, but he continued. And he did several experiments, many experiments. Uh, one of them was um, he basically took the prism and broke up the light into its colors, put it through more holes. So put the prism through another hole so that basically only one light color was coming through at a time. Then put another prism. Now what's that going to do? Well, I mean, this is, this is not necessarily rocket science in terms of the ability to understand what you should do and what you should try, but it is really innovative for the time. And he was among the first to come up with this idea. Um, so, and from, from doing that and finding out that once a color was broken up, it didn't break up again, basically, or didn't go back together again, or didn't do anything uh, strange, he was able to say, and so the true cause of the length of that image was detected to be no other than the light consists of rays differently refrangible. Okay, really interesting terms, but nonetheless, um, it says, which without any respect to a difference in their incidence were, according to their degrees of refrangibility, transmitted towards uh, diverse parts of the wall. When I understood this, I left off my aforesaid glass works, for I saw that the perfection of telescopes was hitherto limited. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wow. He's doing this experiment in prisms, trying to figure out how it works, right? What the light is doing. And he discovers that different lights bend different, different colors of light bend differently through prisms. That's what he discovers, different refrangibility. But as soon as he sees it, he says, whoa, that means telescopes are going to be different. How do you get to there from there? This is where the brilliance of Newton comes in. He saw that if glass is going to spread light out differently from different colors, then you are not going to make a, a, a telescope with glass that's going to work perfectly. That was his conclusion right there. You're done. You can't make a perfect glass lens telescope because of that. And he immediately started work on a telescope that no longer had glass in it. Well, I mean, not the same. He realized that if instead of using glass in that you know, it's going to do this refrangibility for him. If you use a mirror instead, you beat the system, okay? And you don't have this problem of different colors going different directions. And that was critical. And of course, in this same paper, a little further down, he writes, amidst these thoughts, I was forced from Cambridge by the intervening plague. <laughs> I mean, that's... People don't write like that today anymore. But uh, nonetheless, it is kind of interesting that uh, much of his work revolved around the, the day. You had to worry about how life was at the time. Um, he comes up with uh, that basically he gets the idea that light, white light is what it makes up the spectrum. Okay? And this is a new thought. It wasn't that people didn't know that light had came in colors, but that white light was the colors, 
That was kind of a new idea, a new way of looking at it. So uh, he, in the paper, he describes several different things that uh, the doctrine you will find comprehended in the illustration, following propositions. He does a lot of propositions. Here's what I think. Here's why I think so. And uh, for a scientific paper, again, this is amazingly clear. But uh, one of his points is there are therefore two sorts of colors, the ones original and simple and the ones compounded of these. The original or primary colors are red, yellow, blue, and violet purple, together with orange, indigo, and an infinite or indefinite variety of intermediate gradations. Okay, one of the things that I found here that I thought was so interesting is he gives you Roy G. Biv. You've all heard of Roy G. Biv, right? Well, Newton actually used those things. For a while there, when I was a student, I remember thinking, oh, come on, indigo is just made up to make it Biv at the end. That's all, right? But no, Newton himself used the word indigo. So Roy G. Biv really does come from Newton. He, he was among the first to use that idea. Um, anyway, the most surprising and wonderful composition was that whiteness was what it was, was the combination of all the colors. That was an amazing result for Isaac Newton. And of course, the telescope. Um, up here we have a Galilean telescope of the era, more or less. Um, again, that's just two glass lenses, basically. Um, but Newton, this is a replica of the actual telescope he made, changed the game with designing a mirror for reflecting the light and enhancing the image rather than a lens. Change the game. Uh, it was easy to make his larger, too, for that matter. And in fact, it changed the game so much that that change continues to today. And now, if you want a good telescope, you make it a reflecting telescope. Now, there are slight uh, variations on it that are no longer exactly what Newton described, but nonetheless, um, these are in meters, uh, pretty amazing. The, the Subaru up here is what I think I heard was the largest of the mirror telescopes, single mirror telescopes. Is that close to right? That's close to right. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's one bigger now? But it could be older, but yeah, the Subaru Telescope, which is on Maui? Uh, no, it's on Big Island. Big Island, okay, it's on Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, is a huge telescope. This is the radius. This is the diameter, I believe. And the year made, right? Um, but his idea of using reflective telescopes is now what what the state of the art in astronomy is. Okay. Um, well, we move on to his time at the Royal Mint. Uh, clearly, that was his job. So that was what people knew him for in the day. Okay. Um, but the man had moral character like crazy. Uh, in fact, in his lifetime, I think he was not terribly well liked because of it. But he had plenty of moral character. And uh, one of the things that that led to was that he vehemently prosecuted counterfeiting. In about 1690 or so, if you did a uh, survey, of the, he did a survey of the coins that were in general public use, and he found that somewhere between 10 and 20% of all the coins in use at the time were counterfeit. 
So it was time to do something. Uh, he had to do something. And so one of the things he did was he basically recoined everything. He did one of the more massive recoinings ever done. Um, I think the deal was uh, somewhere in the three million pounds range of coins. That's, that would be like uh, $300 million now of coins that he basically recalled and reissued, okay? Um, the number was, the number that he did within one or two years was similar to the total number of coins that had been made in the previous 35 years, okay? So he really ramped up everything. Did an amazing job. Uh, one of the things that that did, uh, one of the things that he did in this great recoinage was he changed the processes for uh, translating money from gold to silver, silver to gold. And it isn't clear whether this was inadvertent or not, but effectively he changed from a silver standard to a gold standard for coins, okay? You might think, what's the big deal? Well, when he did that, when he made that happen, what he effectively did was he undervalued, or he changed the value of silver in his system so that his country, the importers and exporters, would then pay for goods in silver because everybody else was still on the silver standard. But they would, um, they would buy, or they would sell their goods for gold because they were on a gold standard. That eventually led to a depletion of silver in the system. The, the English system lost a bunch of silver out of their system from that. It isn't clear whether that was his intent or not, but it certainly was the result, and it may or may not have been a good idea. He also, in an effort to cut down on uh, counterfeiting, one of the things that you could do uh, there were plenty of ways to counterfeit. One thing you could do, you could take a typical coin and shave off the edge of it, just a little bit. You don't have to take much off. But if you get 100 coins a day and you shave off a little bit off of each one of those coins, pretty soon you're gonna have a little pile of silver or gold or whatever, right? You do that 100 times a day, if you're, if you're a merchant, every time you get a coin in, you take a little bit off, then you put it back in the till and you use it for change and away it goes, right? You eventually have a nice little pot, pile of silver or gold. Um, but at that time, coins were worth what they weighed. They were not necessarily as much tied to their face value like they are today in our system. We look at a quarter, it's worth a quarter of a dollar. We look at a dollar, it's worth a dollar. But that piece of paper has no intrinsic value, right? It only has value because you believe it has value. Um, in, that, in those days, it had value because it was silver or because it was gold. But if it had less gold, then it had less value. Uh, so this was a problem. And he, he came up with the idea of milling the edges, or, or actually engraving the edges of coins. Like that. I don't know if you can see it very well. But you could, you could mill it. Milling is the lines, right? Um, like a quarter, US quarter, has milling around the edges. A nickel does not, okay? But if you engrave something in it too, it makes it that much harder to counterfeit. And this was, uh, Newton's idea to, to generate those kinds of coins. This is much harder to counterfeit uh, because you'll be able to see if people are, first of all, if they're scraping off, that's, that's going to be clear right away. If somebody's scraping off a little bit of it, pretty soon you have a smooth surface and that's not the coin that is going to work. So it was, a, it was a change, a big change in the way that uh, it would be done, that uh, monetary transactions would happen when Newton uh, 
I've changed all that. Okay, so a quote attributed to Newton is, if I have seen further than others, it is because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. And I believe that's true. Because as you can see, I think I showed, there was a lead up, a lead in. There were people working on these very issues just before he made all the breakthroughs. Now, he did make a lot of breakthroughs, but there were people doing it. Um, and I ran across a little limerick on Isaac Newton that you can take or leave. But I want to read something from the Encyclopedia of Physics that I think does really uh, encompass what I'm trying to get at with this talk. With the advancing crystallization, Newtonian physics radiated with a galaxy of great names, inspired builders of, on the, of the classical view of the physical world. Only a few principal milestones can be indicated, each a giant in his own uh, a panoramic view of the glorious century of promise of scientific paradise. Uh, and, and they go on to talk about some equations and they say, yet these equations so brilliantly describe natural processes pointed inevitably to the deterministic and mechanic, mechanistic universe. Newton must be regarded as the founder of the mechanistic world view, even though he had difficulty in harmonizing mechanistic natural philosophy with his belief in God. Um, and a little bit more about God and then, therefore, the universe was ultimately knowable and predictable. Uh, the, this uh, triumphant physics encouraged the rise of materialistic philosophy that actually shaped the di dialectic, di dialectic uh, materialism of Marx and Engel which became the official doctrine of the ruling communist state of the 20th century. How many different areas has he touched with all this? He changed the world from start to finish. This one man was a pivotal person in the life, or in the history of science, in the history of the world. And with that, are there any questions? Uh, when, when Newton was doing his prism experiments, do you know um, known and understood for other kinds of waves, yeah. water waves, oh. sound waves, etc.? Uh, Snell had done his work. So the idea of Snell's law, in fact, Newton mentions in the paper uh, ratios of signs and oh. things like that. So he did understand what was going on from the scientific point of view. And yes, it was reasonably described in those terms. It was just that the different wavelengths had not been really right. understood. But with Snell's law understood in terms of, I mean, did it have to be a wave versus a particle in the current understanding? I mean, I know that you know, Newton had a <laughs> particle theory right. of light. Right. And so I'm wondering, you know, do people think of Snell's law as a wave or a particle phenomenon? Uh, I mean, I'm, they had the law. I have know. no doubt that they understood it in terms of water waves, too. Yeah. So I don't really know yeah. whether uh, he was fighting the fighting the system by calling it a particle. Yeah. Yes, Steve. In the video that you have to show Armstrong and Tony Moon, when Feather and Hammer fell, fell at the same rate. The moon has gravity, which is one sixth of the Earth gravity. Yes. How can the other effect of gravity have on the Feather and Hammer was negligent? Why? You said they fell the same. I have a question. Yes. What is your assessment uh, to the recent, relatively recent, attacks on Newton's laws when they say we are no more Newtonians, we are just whatever? What, what are the, what's, what's your take on this? Well, um, Newton's laws are a reasonably good approximation of what is really happening. The uh, attacks are actually further focusing on it and looking at, at deeper details. And uh, you still need the, the new systems to follow the old uh, law. It has to incorporate the old way, the New Newton's way. It's just that there are situations that are a little more uh, 
uh, complicated but also much more rare to see in our everyday life than what uh, Newton was talking about. So you yeah, can have things going very, very fast that do slightly different things than maybe what Newton would have predicted. That's now, on a scale of 1 to 100, if uh, Newton, there is no perfection, of course, in anything. We just uh, Now, would you consider these attacks taking the 5% that are not correct or accurate or 10% or 20 or what? Well, it certainly depends on what area of the uh, physical reality we're worrying about. If you're looking at the interior of a neutron star or something, then the, these basic uh, things are probably not going to apply very well. But if you're looking at normal things that we see every day, then Newton's laws describe 95% uh, very, very well. So it depends a little bit on the, the area that we're looking at. Any conflict between Einstein's things and uh, uh, Isaac Newton's things? Uh, no, that's the point. I, Einstein uh, reduces to Newton's in the case for normal speeds and normal normal times and things like that. Uh, Einstein's does use does uh, completely reflect Newton. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. If you can go back to that quote on uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Yes. <laughs> Uh, one biographer has a very interesting take on it, um, that it doesn't mean what we all take it to mean. It's a great statement, but uh, remember Robert Hook, mm -hmm. yes. his protagonist. Yes. And I didn't get along very well. Right. Guess how big he was. A giant? He's very short. Oh, very short. <laughs> and this was in a response to him. Ah. <laughs> uh huh. Could be. Could be. So I think he was giving credit to was, some of the people that went before him, and maybe he was stepping right over Hook on that one, <laughs> but he was giving some credit to some I think he was induced to give an apology to Hook at the time, and he wasn't very happy about doing that, and uh, inserted this phrase in there, and kind of perhaps a double meaning, but can't be So maybe he had some sense of humor, too. <laughs> Uh, the record doesn't show that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for coming. And 1160 students, make sure you sign the paper. And they landed at the same time. And on the, moon, huh? on the moon. Of course, we know that that wouldn't happen here. They, they would not land at exactly the same time. But on the moon, they do. Um, not because the moon is any different in terms of gravity than the Earth, but because of air resistance. The whole difference. So, um, Principia has some discussions about. Uh, well, ultimately, it was calculus that uh, Newton changed the world with in terms of math. Um, what he was talking about here, this is one of his memos, um, was if we talk about a function <laughs> like this, and we try to figure out what the area in the function is, okay, area of the function, one way to do it would be divide the area up into rectangles. And so he's, he's figuring out some rectangles to work from. And if you get the rectangles, maybe you can figure out the area. Now, this is not news. Uh, this was 2,000 years earlier, people were thinking in terms of that, trying to figure out areas with rectangles like that. Uh, but Newton did understand some things about it. Um, you know, you, you want to determine, are you inside the curve? Are you outside the curve? What size rectangles are we talking about? So we work from that. But here's the step that Newton did that nobody else could quite understand. And that was make the rectangles smaller. Smaller and smaller and smaller. 
once you get the rectangles to be infinitesimal, the, the concept of exceedingly small rectangles was what got Newton to calculus, brought calculus together. This had the amazing change in the universe of going from discrete to continuous. You could now talk about smooth curves and understand what was going on with them. You could do the area under a curve, under any curve, under any shape, much better. And the, the continuous world, going from everything had to be sort of described by a step at a time to we can have smooth motion, we can understand that sort of thing, it was a huge change, huge. As opposed to trying to explain things sort of as they come along. This explains this. Uh, we explain one thing in terms of others. Um, a, a very different way of thinking about it. So um, also predating Newton was Galileo. And he did an awful lot of uh, useful things too. He actually started to understand falling objects. Um, but he did it sort of as a ratio of times um, or distances. He had inclined planes that he would roll balls down. And he could understand that it didn't really matter what the angle was, the distance increased, the ratio of the distances increased by odd numbers. And that was the beginning of understanding what's going on when something falls. And of course, he was able to extrapolate to falling objects, which uh, it's not entirely clear that uh, that was an experiment that was done. But there were a lot of things about Galileo's life that are not entirely clear they were perfect. Uh, the, the stories are completely true. But nonetheless, he did get some of it. But notice, this is still a very discrete way of looking at the world, one step at a time. Very discrete mathematics. Uh, not looking at the whole universe, looking at pieces, one bit at a time. Uh, but he is, he is credited with an interesting uh, little statement here. We do this. Oh.
He was primarily a philosopher and mathematician. Um, but one of the interesting things that he did, he got for us, was that uh, he believed that the entire universe operated on mechanical principles. That's a big step forward in terms of science, to think that way.